All right, so let's resume. And then, uh, so what I'm going to do next is to introduce some material uh, regarding memory networks in the context of reinforcement learning. Um, and then in particular, so we've already covered in the past long short term memory networks. So this is a, a classic type of network that uh, uses a, a very simple type of memory. But then there's some more elaborate type of networks that um, can uh, do some more interesting things. Uh, so we're going to talk about how we can um, come up with some ways of addressing a memory and then even uh, see how we can read and write uh, into some memories, so some external memories, uh, in a way that, that's going to be differentiable so that we can essentially do end-to-end -end learning, including through the operations that read and write to the memory. Now, an important mechanism that is often used in the context of memories is going to be a, the attention mechanism, so we'll also explain this. Uh, okay, and then the, uh, the papers that I've listed here, these are just examples, so there's actually a, a large literature of papers, but then uh, these are two classic ones that, that are worth looking at. Okay, so if you recall, a long short-term memory network has the following architecture. So um, we have various gates that will control what happens inside the, the network. And then the benefit here is that um, the memory, which is essentially uh, the core of, of the cell, uh, can be controlled more explicitly. So uh, there's usually an input at every step, and then there will be a gate that will decide whether that input will make it into the memory. Now, whatever we've got into the memory at a certain time step, there's also usually a forget gate that will decide whether uh, what is already stored will remain or be erased. And then we also have an output gate that decides how uh, what is already stored in memory uh, can be uh, produced as, as an output. Okay, so one um, very important aspect of, of um, long short term memory units is this idea of gates. And in fact, there's, there's many other types of network that, that use uh, gated units. And then the idea is that these gates are all numbers between zero and one, that where the idea is that if the gate is set to zero, then essentially the gate would be closed and then information cannot go through. Because for instance, if we have the input gate set to zero, whenever we multiply the input by zero, then it means that the input is erased and the input will not influence uh, the, uh, the memory of, of the cell. Uh, and then for the forget gate, there's something similar. If the forget gate is set to zero, then uh, whatever was in the memory will be erased. And then similarly, if the output gate is set to zero, then whatever was in the memory will not make it out. It will get erased as well. And then conversely, if all those gates are set to one, then they're open. And then at that point, the input can make it into the, uh, the cell. Um, and then the forget gate, if it is set to one, then it means that we remember the information. So the information is, is uh, perpetrated uh, at every step. And then if the output gate is set to one, then the information can also be produced as an output, okay? So, so this architecture is a classic architecture um, that uh, can be unrolled. And then if you recall, um, this is one way of enrolling um, this type of uh, unit. So here, think that we've got a, a recurrent neural network that would have some inputs at different time steps. Those inputs would normally get aggregated into some hidden units, and then those hidden units would after that produce some output. But now instead of having the inputs get into the hidden units, and then the hidden units essentially evolve over time and then produce some outputs always in the same way at every step, then we can introduce some gates so here, these are the same gates as on the previous slide. So I've got in green the input gate, in blue the forget gate, and then in red the output gate, all right? And then so at every step, there's a gate that will control information on each arc. And, and therefore, we have a more explicit way 
of determining or controlling what happens to the information. But in any case, this is a, a simple approach in which uh, we have a memory at every time step, so h, the, the hidden vector, is essentially a memory, uh, so it's a vector of numbers, and then at every step the network will manipulate this memory, will essentially change the values in, in those memory, and then also use them to produce some outputs possibly. Right? So this is a, a good starting point, but if you think about computers in general, uh, so we have some more explicit ways of controlling whatever is in some memory. Uh, so we'd like sometimes to just be able to read information from a memory. In some cases, we also want to uh, erase or, or change uh, the values that, that are in, in some memories. And perhaps we don't want to apply the exact same operations to all entries in, in the memory. So here, this type of network the memory consists of a vector, and then the vector, well, we, we have essentially the same operations that are applied, um, and then the, the memory is, is, is fairly simple in, in terms of um, operations, okay? So now what we're going to see is that there's some more general ways of, let's say, accessing only parts of the information or retrieving just uh, certain records in, in the memory. And similarly, when, we're, when we would like to write information, then perhaps instead of just having a, a forget gate and an, and an input gate uh, that, that would like uh, apply to the entire memory, we'd like to have something that is more selective that can essentially just address part of the memory, erase that part, change it, and, and, and so on. And then maybe move to read to a different part and, and, and so on. Okay, any questions so far? Is there some long and short memory difference for the integer? So is there a difference between yeah, this the, figure the and? Board. I mean, does, it, does this figure represent the, the long and short memory thing? Yes, so yeah, so this, this is just the unroll version of the long short term memory unit. So it's the same as the LSTM that we had on the previous slide. Okay, so this is the uh, uh, recurrent version Right, so each arc that has a, a black square indicates that this is an arc that uh, goes from one time step to another. And then whenever I unroll this by creating multiple time steps, then I get this network. Okay, so those two are equivalent. So this one, uh, I actually feel like it's easier to understand because once it's unrolled, then we can clearly see what's going on. Whereas otherwise, when we have the recursive part, even though it's uh, more succinct, it's, uh, you know, it requires a bit of imagination to understand what's going on. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so let's have a look at um, uh, a concrete model that is often used in dialog systems as well as machine translation or uh, NLP in general. Um, so the encoder-decoder model um, is a classic type of recurrent neural network where what happens is that we have an input sentence that corresponds to X and then there's going to be an output sentence that corresponds to Y. If we're doing machine translation, this could be a sentence in English and then the output could be a sentence in French. If we're doing um, uh, dialogue management, this could be a, a question and then this could be the answer. Okay, so so this is a, a general model, and in this model, um, you can use LSTM units um, that I just um, uh, explained again. Um, and then when you use the LSTM units, the idea is that um, those units, they have a memory, and then this memory, which is this hidden vector, can be used to essentially memorize or embed the sentence, okay? so. If we have a sentence, let's say, I love machine learning, right? then you can essentially encode this, uh, where you can take every word, encode it, uh, and then combine it with the next word, combine it with the next word, and so on, until you have an encoding of the entire sentence. Right? And then you can do this using this type of network, Right, where the inputs are the words, like I love machine learning, 
And then uh, the hidden units are going to be the memory. So these are essentially vectors, right? So don't think of them as just being uh, scalars, but actually vectors, right? And then uh, each vector is essentially um, a memory um, that, that gets produced at, at every step. And then the idea is that at the end of the sentence, then we are, end up with an embedding that presumably would capture all of the information of the sentence. So it should capture the meaning of the sentence. And then um, from there, there's going to be a decoder that will then produce the response. OK, so here, yeah, we have this hidden vector that corresponds to the memory. And then it, so at the end of the encoder, we have a single vector here that is called C for context. And then this is the embedding of our input sentence. If we're doing machine translation, then this can be used after that to uh, start decoding by producing the same sentence, but in a different language. Right? And then the idea is that this vector should now have memorized all of the information, all of the meaning of the input sentence. And now the decoder will then use that to produce words that correspond to um, the input sentence, but in a different language at every step. Okay? So, so this becomes clear that we can think of the LSTM type units as producing a memory because at least in the context of machine translation, then the, the hidden vector at the end of the encoder needs to capture all the information about the input sentence if the decoder is going to succeed and produce a corresponding translation. Yeah? Yeah, very good question. So yeah, here the encoder has four time steps um, or a sequence of, of four units. And then the decoder happens to have the same number, but this is just a coincidence. Okay, If you're doing machine translation or if you're doing question answering, there's no reason why the output here should have the same number of units or the same number of, of steps. Okay. So, so here, if you're doing machine translation, for instance, a common approach would simply be to say that um, whenever we generate a sentence, we are unrolling the network uh, a bit like here. So the decoder can be unrolled one step at a time. And then what happens is that at every step, you produce an output, which is going to be a, a word, uh, the next word in, in the sentence. And then you would stop whenever you produce a special code that would correspond to the end of sentence uh, code. So you can think of this as like a special symbol or special word uh, that you insert into the vocabulary. And then when uh, it produces that special end of sentence code, then you know that you can stop. Uh, and, and that's why then the beauty of, of a recurrent neural net like this is that you can unroll it for as many steps as you need. So you'd keep on unrolling this until you get that special end of sentence. Yeah. <clears throat> yes? So yeah, in, in theory here, the, the sentences can be arbitrarily long. This is in theory because in practice, um, there is going to be a challenge. So here I explained how, let's say we are using an LSTM network like this for the encoding part, right? Then if I just go back um, here, yeah, so then the idea is that the encoder will produce this context vector that needs to capture the entire meaning of the sentence. But in reality, the, the initial words, right, then they start to be accumulated into the memory. But then this memory, even though we might have some uh, input gates, forget gate, and, 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 and so on, there is a risk that we're going to forget the information from the first few words. So LSTM networks tend to be better than just 
regular recurrent neural networks without these types of gates in terms of remembering information from the past, but still they're subject to forgetting over time. Okay, so, so now uh, we're going to see that one solution for this has been to treat not just the last uh, vector, uh, so the last vector here as the thing that we're going to use to produce the, uh, the translation, but to also use some notion of attention that allows the decoder to essentially kind of go back and see what were the words that I had in my sentence. Like for instance, as a human being, let's say you're doing some translation between two, language, two languages that you know. If you have a long sentence, you might start translating the sentence and then you know, at some point you might stop and go back and then check again what, what was the sentence that I'm translating. Because I mean, as, as humans, right, uh, we can read a sentence, memorize it, and then translate it. But then there's a risk that, you know, we're going to read the sentence, understand it. Then we start translating and they're like, oh, wait a second. What, what was this sentence saying again? And then, you know, you need to go back and check the sentence again, right? So here, there's a risk as well that this type of architecture will forget some of the early words, uh, especially if the sentence is super long. And then as a result, uh, this won't work well. OK, and so this is where attention was introduced um, in, in neural networks. In fact, um, OK, attention was not introduced for the first time just in, in machine translation, but at least in the context of machine translation, it happens to be a very important mechanism that led to some important uh, uh, improvements for accuracy. OK, so. In any case, with just this approach um, of using a recurrent neural network that uses LSTM units, then um, these are some examples of sentences that, that got translated. So you could have uh, these expressions as source. And then uh, these are examples of um, uh, translations that are considered ground truth. And then uh, the RNN encoder decoder um, can produce the following sentences or the following expressions. Okay, so, so it, does, it does work quite well. But here you'll notice that all of these are fairly short and it has to do with this problem where um, the earlier words otherwise might get forgotten. Okay, so, so yeah, as I mentioned, this is where attention uh, can become an important uh, mechanism for this. So here attention is an idea where what you do is that you try to align um, some of the words that you're outputting with the words that are part of the source sentence. Um, so this is very important in machine translation. It's also important in image captioning. And then we can also use attention as just a general mechanism to address a memory. Okay, so if we think of regular memories in, in computers, right, then we typically have the notion of an address and then whenever we want to look up information in a memory, then we use the address of the specific entry that we're looking for and same thing for writing, right? So, so we don't think of the memory as like just one big blob that we write or read all at once, but we typically just look up something specific into the memory. And then, so we're gonna use as well an attention mechanism to also address or, or specify uh, a specific location in, into the memory. Okay, so attention in machine translation will allow us to align each output word with relevant input words by computing a softmax of the inputs. So here, the idea is that uh, it's very often the case in machine translation that you can do some word for word translation. And, and then so obviously this is not going to be optimal, but it will at least give you, you know, a, a, a baseline or some, some basic translation. So you could actually just take each word of the input sentence and then, and then look it up into a dictionary and then translate it, right? So when you're doing the translation, even though you're trying to think of the translation at the sentence level, 
often you need to go and, and translate certain words, just thinking of their meaning at the word level. And then so um, by using an attention mechanism, then we're going to be able to facilitate this. And, and then concretely, what this will mean is that we're going to be computing a softmax between some of the input words uh, that might be relevant and, and then the next output word that we're trying to produce. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got a context vector CI. Um, so here if I go back, right, so we had a context vector C that presumably captured everything um, from the input sentence. But what we could also do is produce a context vector CI that instead of capturing everything, could try to just capture what is relevant to translate or produce the next word. Okay, so let's say that we started to produce a translation here, and now we're in the process of generating the second word. Now to generate the second word, right, we might need to look back at our sentence and identify what might be some of the relevant words. And then for those relevant words, maybe we'd like to combine all of that information into a very specific context vector. And this context vector is not going to be about the entire sentence, but just what is relevant to produce the next word. Okay, so, so, yeah, so we're going to produce this um, by taking uh, here a weighted combination. Um, yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, the context word is going to be a weighted sum of the input encodings. So, the input encodings, hj, these are the hidden vectors uh, in the encoder. So, we're going to take a weighted combination of those guys. And here, a ij is going to be the alignment weight between the input encoding hj and then some output encoding si. So as we're trying to produce um, some output words, right, then we would like to see again what might be the relevant input words and then um, so the, these weights aij are going to tell us essentially um, with what probability or with what um, weight um, each input word might be relevant to produce the next output word. Okay, so let's say that we have some hidden vector si uh, to produce the, the next um, uh, word in, into the translation. Then we're going to want to compare this to uh, the um, the hidden vectors that correspond to the uh, words and in the input. And, and then so by taking here the alignment between SI and HJ, then that is going to correspond to uh, this AIJ. Um, well, sorry, the AIJ is here. So, so we're going to take the exponential of that. And this is essentially a softmax. Okay. So it's quite common um, whenever we want to do attention there will be some form of softmax and the idea is that at the end of the day we're going to come up with some distribution. So the AIJs, you can think of them as weights but otherwise they're, they correspond to a distribution. So it's a bunch of numbers between 0 and 1 that sum up to 1. And then when we take a linear combination here, we're essentially combining um, the, the, the input words that matter uh, based on, on their weight. And, and then so if, let's say, we're trying to translate a specific word like machine, and, and, and then so we would like to attend to that specific word, then we would expect the weight to be high for this and, and weight for other words to be low. Okay. So, yeah, so in any case, um, then the softmax will give us this distribution and then we can use it after that to take a linear combination. And now in this function, right, so the softmax will take some alignment scores and those alignment scores are simply going to be, um, well, there's many ways we can com compute an alignment score, but the simple way is just to compute a dot product. Okay, so if I have an embedding of some word, hj, and then I have an embedding for what I'd like to produce next, 
And then those two embeddings, they're vectors. And if those vectors, they align in the sense that taking their dot product is going to be high, then perhaps it means that Hj is relevant to Si. And then, um, so this will give me a high alignment score. Okay, so this is a common thing uh, in natural language processing, but otherwise in neural networks where uh, you might have embeddings for various things. It, it doesn't have to be words, it could be images, it could be all kinds of things. So uh, these embeddings are vectors. And now whenever we wanna compare different um, objects or different entities together, then you can take their embeddings, these vectors, and then see how well they align. So those vectors, uh, you can think of them as, as essentially uh, two vectors in, into a Euclidean space, and then their alignment, you could essentially measure the angle between the two vectors, and then taking the dot product is a way of measuring how well they align if the vectors are parallel or perpendicular, because if they're perpendicular, the dot product here is going to be zero, but if they're parallel, Right? If they align well, then the dot product is going to be high. Any questions regarding this? Okay, good. All right, so let's draw a picture now that will illustrate more concretely how this works uh, in, in the context of machine translation. Okay, so for this picture, um, yeah, let me just keep this slide up here. Um, okay, so in fact, let's go back to this picture here. So I normally have the input words that are going to lead to some encodings that are denoted by H, okay? So here, I'm going to assume that I have already H1, H2, H3, and so on, up to Hn, okay? So these are vectors, okay? and then they correspond to those nodes here. Okay, and now um, I would like to produce some output. Let's say that I wanna produce Y2, and then I have as well some encodings um, that, that are relevant for producing those, those words. And then um, let's say that I'm, I'm about to produce Y2, so I have already S1, which would be the encoding of Y1, and I wanna produce S2. So what I can do is take the encoding um, S1, okay, and then I can compare that to the encoding of all the words in, in my input to see what might be relevant, okay? So I'm going to compute an alignment score um, yeah, so the alignment score here, I'm just going to take the dot product between Si and Hj, okay? So here I'm gonna take a dot product between S1 and all of the Hs here, okay? So, okay, so then this will give me, um, yeah, a score, so let's call it, uh, yeah, score one. I've got score two, score three, and score n. Okay, so I'm gonna take those dot products. So here, all of these arcs here, they correspond to taking a dot product. Um, then from the scores, um, I'm going to compute the softmax, which will give me the probability or the weight, okay? So from the scores, I will produce here a one, a two, a three, and a n, okay? And in reality, I need all of the scores. So here you see I would take the exponential of each score divided by the sum of all the scores. So to produce a one, I need score one, as well as score two, score three, and score n. And then same thing for uh, the second one, same thing for the third one, and same thing for the last one, okay? So basically I need all the scores to uh, come up with the probabilities. Okay, and then after this, 
um, once I have the probabilities, then I can compute the linear combination. So then I would uh, produce here C1, which is going to be uh, essentially A1 times H1. Um, yeah, let me write it this way. So I'm going to take A1 times H1, then A2 times H2. I'll take A3 times H3, and An times Hn, and then each one of them will feed into C1, where I take a summation. Okay. So this illustrates essentially the attention mechanism. And then I would do this um, for at, at every step, whenever I'm about to come up with um, the context vector here for that particular word that I'm going to generate next, um, then I can see how the, what I had previously uh, compares to the embeddings of, of the words in my input to see what are the relevant words. And I don't have to rely just on, on the memory that I have. So I can essentially check what's relevant before and then use that internally. OK. Any questions regarding this? Yeah. Uh, I guess we can also learn the base AIJ instead of using this formula. Um, we can learn the weights AIJ. Uh, yes, that's right. Let's see. So yeah, so the weights A, I, J here, they come from uh, just doing a soft max. So in a soft max, there aren't any parameters per se. But on the other hand, what we could do is for the alignment score, here what I did is I simply took the dot product. But what we might want to do is essentially take um, a, a bilinear product where I would have the vector times a matrix times the next vector, where we can think that the matrix in between is essentially remapping those vectors into a different space, where then it's, it makes sense to align them. So there, there, there might be some, some parameters as well that we might want to introduce to make this learnable. Is this what you were after? Uh, yes, kind of. Kind of, OK. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? OK. <clears throat> All right, so now in the context of machine translation, if you use uh, attention, then you will, generally speaking, end up with better results, especially for long sentences. So here, this is a graph that shows sentence length with respect to the BLUR score. The BLUR score here stands for Bilingual Evaluation Under Study. And roughly speaking, it is a measure of the percentage of words in common between the translation and the ground truth. This is roughly speaking, there's an actual formula. Uh, there's some details to this, but you can just think of it at a, as a high level in this way. Okay, So it's not uh, the greatest measure, but it's a simple measure that you can use. So if you have lots of words that are common between the translation and the ground truth, then there's, the odds are good that a translation is, is, is good too. Okay. Obviously, this does not take into account the ordering of the words. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, if you have uh, no word in common that the translation is wrong. So, so this is just a, a very simple measure, but it is commonly used in, in machine translation. And then so the, the higher the blue score is, the better. And you can see that uh, many of those techniques often would obtain high blur score but then it would drop once the sentences get longer because at that point the RNN isn't capable of remembering everything uh, when it does the encoding. <coughs> okay, so yeah, when you look at those curves, uh, RNN search are the ones with attention. So in particular, this one here is with attention and then no attention, that's RNN encoding. Uh, so it would correspond to the last two here, and these are the, the worst ones, okay? And then here, you might want to use a, uh, an internal memory. I believe the 50 versus 30 is just the length of the vector uh, in, inside the LSTM units, okay? Um, yeah, so then 
you can obtain much better results by um, using uh, an attention mechanism because then nothing is really forgotten. The attention mechanism can kind of go back into the original sentence and attend to what matters. Okay. Um, as an example, uh, so here we've got uh, some sentences in French and then in English and then it shows when, um, so I believe here the, no actually I'm not sure, so either the input was French and then the output was English or vice versa. I don't remember in this example which one was input, which one was output, but in any case you can see um, where there was a tension, so like the was um, closely related to L apostrophe, agreement was closely related to accord, and so on. And then um, often in different languages, the words are not going to follow the same order. So you can see here that there, there's a difference in word ordering between French and English, um, and that's why we have this pattern. Okay, so if you're familiar with both languages, you should be able to verify that this is, you know, a, a pretty good translation. Okay, so now we can do something similar um, in general with also um, the notion of attention, but with respect to just a memory that might be outside of the network. So in natural language processing, it's often the case that you want to rely on additional sources of information. Like you might have a database of information uh, that you might want to leverage in terms of, of producing answers. Uh, so specifically, if we consider question answering or dialogue systems, then we might have a database of message response pairs where here, this database, we'd like to make it available to the neural network. And then we can think of this database as essentially a memory that we would like to be able to address or read into. Okay. So here, let's imagine that we have such a database. Uh, so we've got message response pairs, and we're going to store this database into a memory. Okay. So concretely, what this means is that we're going to have our neural network. And then the neural network is going to have access to a memory where in our memory we're going to have some messages. So here messages and then responses. So, so we're going to have essentially several, well many of those, an entire database. Okay. And now here what we could do is let's say that we want to do question answering or, or otherwise run a dialogue system that perhaps could um, try to leverage the fact that we have the messages and the responses in, into a memory. Uh, so let's say that there is a, a query or a new message that comes in. We're going to call it Q. Then what we could do is simply measure the alignment of the query with each message. Okay, so we're going to have a query Q. So here's my query Q. And now I'd like to measure the alignment between the query and each of the message. Now those messages, instead of having them just written in whatever language, we could imagine that they've already been encoded using an encoder model like the one that I showed you earlier. Okay? So in the memory, we're going to have essentially vectors of embeddings of those messages. And then the query queue, same idea, we're going to assume that it's been embedded using some type of encoder model, so it's going to be as well a vector. So now from this point on, what we can do is take the vector that corresponds to Q and see how it aligns with the messages here. And the idea is if the, if the vector Q captures correctly or captures well the meaning of the question, and then every vector here also captures well the meaning of those messages. If we find that the question is similar in terms of meaning to one of the messages here, then maybe the answer is simply to essentially retrieve the corresponding response for the message that, that aligns well uh, in, in, in the question. 
So this would be a simple approach to essentially leverage a database of message response pairs where instead of trying to just match the query by uh, some type of added distance, you could leverage the fact that the memory uh, could store information in the form of vector embeddings, and now you would like to see how the messages compare to the query. So here we can measure some alignment between each message and the query simply by computing the dot product. Okay, so here mi is for message i, so we're going to have m1, m2, m3, and so on. And then similarly, um, well actually yeah, these are for the messages, then we're going to get here some measure of alignment. I can compute a distribution by using a softmax, and then um, based on this, after this I can come up with a response. So the response is going to be the linear combination of the response embeddings corresponding to the message uh, that are closest to the question. Okay, so this could be a simple way to retrieve um, a response embedding, and then after that we'd have to decode the response accordingly. Okay, so this is a, a, a simple approach that will take advantage of the fact that we have such a memory. And this is a general scheme, so very often a lot of uh, memory networks are going to have some sort of key value pairs, and the idea is that you want to use information that's in there by always comparing some type of query embedding with uh, the key embeddings, and then retrieve some type of weighted average of the value embeddings, and then use that afterwards. Okay, so uh, this particular architecture can also be used for reading comprehension. So I've got here an example um, that was taken from a paper on end-to-end -end memory networks, where let's say that we have some sentences. This corresponds to a piece of text, and now we need to answer a question with respect to, to that text. So what we can do is embed the sentences into some vector encoding. So this is here uh, our memory um, where we've embedded the sentences. So this is, let's say, all in English. This would be uh, vector embeddings. And then if we have a question, that's another vector. So we can take the dot product or, or the inner product between the question and each one of the messages here or each one of the sentences here. And then uh, this when you pass this through a softmax, then you're going to get a probability distribution. Okay? So this distribution tells us now which messages are most relevant. And then depending on what the task is, we might have another embedding regarding the response, or it could be the same embedding. Okay? Like in this case here, you see I have key value pairs. In this particular example, there is just a bunch of sentences but they happen to have different embeddings, one for the key part and one for the value part for what will be outputted. And then you take a weighted combination based on, on the probabilities that gives you an output here. And then um, based on this, they're going to have now a sum of the output and the question embedding and then multiply this through uh, some matrix of weights W to produce um, uh, a, a predicted answer. Okay, and just to illustrate, uh, the type of tasks that they looked at are what are known as um, uh, the baby tasks that Facebook came up with. Um, so the, this was an important benchmark at some point for reading comprehension. So you have here a bunch of sentences, there's a question, where is John? The answer is bathroom, and the prediction here is bathroom. But if you look carefully, if you just check John in here, so there's John went to the bedroom, John traveled to the bathroom, so it's unclear which one of those two. In this case, you see, what they do is that they have a first pass where through an attention mechanism, they realize that those two sentences are most relevant. So here this shows the probability, uh, the weights, and then based on that, uh, they will do in fact several um, iterations of attention and eventually converge onto the last one. 
the second example here is more interesting. So if we ask what color is Greg? So here, Greg is a frog, but then you have to look at the fact that, um, let's see. Um, okay, so the answer is yellow. So Brian is yellow and Brian is a frog. Right, so I guess here, yeah, we have that Greg is a frog, Brian is a frog, so we've got two frogs, and then uh, the answer is yellow. So then you can attend to the first message here. Then after this, into a second iteration, you attend to the message here for Brian is a frog, and then after that, you attend to Brian is yellow in, in the third iteration, okay? Um, all right, so one last slide. Let me just point out that now we can also generalize LSTM units to uh, not just have a vector that corresponds to a memory, but here something that might be much more complex like this. And then uh, we can generalize the gates where uh, we could replace the output gate by an attention mechanism to essentially retrieve from the memory whatever we want to produce. So here the attention mechanism allows us to extract just information from a few entries in the memory. So for producing an output, this is very useful. And then we can also generalize the forget gate and input gate uh, in a way that they would still correspond to having numbers that are between 0 and 1 for deciding what information stays and what information gets into the memory, but you could have vectors of numbers instead of a single number that would apply to the entire memory. So that this way the operations can be more local, more selective, and then, um, yeah, so this, this is one way of generalizing this, and in fact, in the papers that are gonna be presented uh, on Friday, we're gonna see some examples where uh, there is a recurrent neural network that essentially generalizes uh, LSTM units in this fashion, where there's going to be a memory that's more comprehensive like this, with some gates that will be uh, more selective in terms of deciding what gets to be erased and what gets to be transformed. Okay, so I think we're over time, so let's stop here, and then yeah, we'll see next class some examples of that. <laughs>